So welcome to uh, the, what is this, August <laughs> edition of uh, the Alta Mesa Center Reading Series. Today we're thrilled to welcome authors uh, Ray Armentrott, Paul Hoover, Elizabeth Robinson, and poet and editor John Thompson to present The Encounter, a handbook of poetic practice. Alta Mesa Center for the Arts is an interfaith arts and spirituality hub housed within and sponsored by Elizabeth, <laughs> Elizabeth Robinson, Arinda Community Church with Pastor Elizabeth Robinson. <laughs> we believe that art is a spiritual act and a human right. We wish to provide a place where people from diverse traditions, artistic practices, and economic realities come together in community. We know that art can bridge the divisions, substantive and arbitrary, that divide us. We come together not only to practice and teach the arts, but to celebrate and learn from our differences and to foster lively and respectful interdisciplinary dialogues. We seek unity in diversity. And wherever you are on your artistic or your spiritual journey, whoever you are, you are welcome here. Again, today we're thrilled to celebrate the encounter a Handbook of Poetic Practice, which is an anthology of personal essays by renowned poets, edited by John Thompson, who is himself a renowned poet, humble though he may be. The central question, one of them, of the book is, where does poetry come from? Which is to say, where do poets come from? And I would ask those of you with us today in the audience, what encounters in your life have given rise to or given you permission to honor that artistic impulse. I'm gonna put in the chat here just a list of all the contributors here to this anthology. So you can just take a look and see the names, many of whom you'll probably recognize. Today, we have three poets with us. Um, writing for the Poetry Foundation, David Wu says of Ray Armentrout, re her recent book, The Finalist, it emanates with radiant astonishment of living thought. Her book, Conjure, was named one of 10 best books of 220 by Library Journal, and her 2018 book, Wobble, was a finalist for the National Book Awards. Her other books with Wesleyan include Partly, New and Selective Poems, Just Saying, Money Shot, and Versed, which won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry and the National Book Critics Circle Award. In 2007, she received a fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation, her poems have appeared in many anthologies and journals, including The Nation, The New Yorker, The London Review of Books, The New York Review of Books, Baum, Harper's, the list goes on. Retired from UC San Diego, where she was a professor of poetry and poetics, she is the current judge of the Yale Younger Poets Prize. Welcome. Thank you. Paul Hoover's poetry includes O oh and Green, New and Selected Poems, and the Book of Unnamed Things. You'll notice also in the program there are links to buy these books. Please do feel free to buy away as you as you hear these writers. With Maria, uh, Maria Baranda, he edited and translated the complete poems of San Juan de la Cruz from Milkweed Editions, which was our first, first um, reading here over a year ago. Professor of Creative Writing at San Francisco State University. He's the editor of two editions of Postmodern American Poetry, a Norton Anthology, and the annual literary magazine, New American Writing. Welcome, Paul. Thank Elizabeth you. Robinson, who is the pastor of Arunda Community Church as well, is the author of several collections of poetry. Her nonfiction essays have recently appeared in The Curator and New Letters. Recent poems appeared or are forthcoming in Bennington Review, Conjunctions, Fence, Image, Plume Poetry, Seneca Review, and Volt. In the past two years, she's been recognized with Editor's Choice Prizes uh, for New Letters and, and Scoundrel Time, an honorable mention in the Gulf Coast Poetry Contest and a Pushcart Prize. John Thompson, our editor edits free verse editions and illuminations, <clears throat> a series on American poetics, his most recent collection, and there is a link to this book, um, Notebooks of Last Things is available now. And I will step back and hand off to John who will move forward. Well, uh, thank you so much, Mary. And it's, uh, 
it's a real pleasure to, to see you in person um, and Ray and Paul and Elizabeth, um, all of whom I've corresponded with, um, but um, haven't had the pleasure of uh, laying my eyes on, uh, not to mention everyone else here. So I just wanted to um, make a few introductory remarks um, uh, uh, and then go directly um, to the reading itself. I, I thought it might be useful to take a minute or two and to just uh, tell you about the, the origin of the project and then a little bit about the scope of the book. Um, uh, so the, the origin of the project um, uh, is, is pretty simple. A couple of years ago, um, I'd been reading an essay by a well-known American poet um, who was describing um, an encounter with another poet, a teacher, in, in fact, um, and uh, the, the gist of the essay was a discussion about um, uh, the formative nature of that encounter. Um, and that really got me thinking about um, what other encounters um, poets have had that, um, that have been important to them. Uh, so originally, uh, I was thinking about this collection as one that had focus on encounters with various kinds of art. Um, but I quickly realized uh, that that container for the book was, was too restrictive. Uh, uh, happily, it turns out there are essays that reflect uh, upon artists such as Agnes Martin, but there are also essays that reflect upon other poets, um, on landscapes, on foreign cultures, on language, uh, on translation, um, on cinema, um, on the experience of being an immigrant, um, on the experience of being homeless. Um, uh, significantly, um, and to me, interestingly, um, a lot of essays ref reflect upon um, key relationships, um, key friendships um, that have been sustaining. Um, and this isn't a complete list. There's a whole host of other kinds of experiences that uh, poets have reflected upon. Um, but uh, these encounters, uh, I think, um, really lead to some interesting insights about what poetry is, or perhaps even what um, poetry can be. All told, 30 poets uh, contributed to this book. So there are 30 different personal essays. Um, all, of, all of the essays here are, are personal essays, people um, uh, writing autobiographically about their own experience. So there are 30 different personal, um, I think, eye-opening essays on the lived experience um, of uh, being a writer, being a poet. Um, and I think collectively they share an interest um, in reflecting on um, the various ways in which poetry comes into the world. Um, so uh, um, one of the things that I noticed was is that a, a lot of uh, poets will reflect upon a kind of charge, um, um, sometimes a, 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 even a, a kind of shock um, that a certain kind of experience ha has offered, um, or else even um, something um, uh, gentler or, or less momentous, but um, still taken cumulatively um, uh, has been um, important or, or transformative. So today's reading is the first of several projected readings from the collection. Uh, so before going to our first reader, um, a warm thanks to, to Mary Vollmer um, for supporting and facilitating the reading and for doing really everything to make it happen. Um, so uh, with those few uh, prefatory remarks, I'll turn it over to our first reader. Okay, uh, hello and thank you for Mary and John and everyone who has come. Um, the title of my essay is called The Renewal of Wrongness and it's really a lot more about a sort of shocking experience after having been writing poetry for many years. Um, 
So with that, I will just proceed. I thought the people living on the street were uncultured and incurious until B told me that he read the entirety of Dickens while sitting in the library drinking gin. J showed me a YouTube of, in which he played trombone in an ensemble. S, when she got out of jail after assaulting a police officer with her prosthetic leg, used to stop by and discuss Nabokov novels with me. A beautiful man at the feed, the soup kitchen, grabbed a tray and sat down to read the Upanishads. And after M was evicted, I found Kierkegaard, Watts, and Kerouac on the sidewalk where the sheriff had dumped his belongings. K and D used to get the bus to Denver on first Friday to go gallery hopping. This was partly due to the ubiquity of free wine in the galleries, but they also liked the art. I did not anticipate that I would frequently lie, that my most effective work entailed circumventing the system that I would apply myself diligently toward violating rules and laws. You are so calm, I was constantly told. That must be why you're good with working, good at with working with homeless people. In fact, I lived in quiet rage. I learned to relish countering the eternal no with a resourceful fuck you. I built trust with disenfranchised people by flagrant violations of privacy, bad boundaries, and disregard of my employer's explicit instructions. I thought that all people wanted identifiable location and address to be addressed. I thought they wanted ease and a place to live. I thought they wanted unity of narrative. I thought they, f they wanted family. I thought they wanted what I want. I was wrong. I was sometimes right. To be wrong about so many things, to experience a thoroughgoing change of ethos while in my 50s, in a word, to be completely humbled, was a salutary experience. All I'd ever really done or wanted to do was write poems. Making poems was a way to configure meaning, to construct a universe. It enabled me to pattern, pattern experience aesthetically. Then the world itself asserted its randomness and forced me to reorient. I found myself waking up in the middle of the night worried about who was at outside at risk of dying of exposure. I couldn't understand, frankly, how it was that so many people didn't die of exposure. I didn't have time to write poems or anything until I stopped to inspect my laptop and found pages and pages of writing to be wrong about so much. I'm going to give an incident and I warn you there's vulgarity in it. Carlo has the face of an angel. He looks young and unmarked. Curly black hair, slim build. I'd never heard of him, and I know most of the unhoused population of Boulder. But suddenly he was a frequent flyer at the jail. When we held jail court, arraignments for jailed individuals, most of them homeless, he was quiet and alert. We always had to get a translator because he let the court know that he speaks no English. He responded appropriately, never elaborated. Like most homeless people, he'd do a couple of days and then be back out on the street. I later learned that Carlo understood English just fine, but in court, he spoke only Spanish. Maybe insisting on a translator, something that dramatically slowed court proceedings, was his subtle protest, a way of gumming up the works. Maybe he just prefers the sound of Spanish. One day, I got word from two police officers that there had been a stabbing. Is the victim anyone I know? I asked. Probably not, they said. Some young guy who just showed up on the scene named Carlo. But, they assured me, I knew the perpetrator, Bug Out. I'd known Bug Out for years, but only as Bug Out. The first time I saw his real name on the jail roster, I had no idea who he was. Turns out that Bug Out, who never, under any circumstances, came to general arraignments for his trespassing camping tickets, wanted to come to court, and he wanted to clean up a bit for the occasion. First, he went over to the 29th Street Mall and tried to steal some pants from Eddie Bauer. He was chased from the store. He then asked the people hanging around his camp if anyone could offer him a relatively clean pair of pants to wear to court. Carlo offered up a pair in exchange for what? a little meth, some alcohol, a joint, a couple of bucks, the deal was done. 
Unfortunately, Bug Out discovered that Carlo's pants weren't so clean after all. In fact, they were literally full of shit. So Bug Out did what any person of honor would do. He stabbed Carlo. When the police showed up on the scene, everyone was numb. No one knew anything about the incident. Bug Out was taken off. Carlo initially refused to go to the hospital, but he was bleeding out pretty profusely. Eventually, Carlo did agree to go, and he allowed as how he had deserved to be stabbed. Asked why, he declined to specify his transgression. Bug Out got picked up and was indignant that he would be arrested under such circumstances. It looked like he might go to prison. People in the fam, his family of the street, bewailed his absence. They love him so much. He's the greatest guy, though he is one of the more difficult psychotic people of my acquaintance. So much for his housing prospects, I thought. But he spent six months at the jail and then was back at the encampment. It's hard for me to account really why I wanted to tell this story here, but here's what I love about it. Carlo's quiet deception in the court that gave him just a little more agency, the new to me orders of honor and affiliation on the street, the fact that I knew Carlo before the police officers did, the fact that I'd known bug out for years without considering what his legal name might be, the fact that so many people love a belligerent, violent, schizophrenic man, the whelm and collage of absurdity that is the through line of this series of events. Zing. It hit me as a great example of poetry. Okay. Drop my computer. That's that. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Thank you, Elizabeth. Paul. Oh, I'm afraid mine's going to be too long, but I've prepared to trim it. Uh, mine's, my essay is uh, called Wild Strawberries. You'll find out soon why. At the age of 11, I left the dentist office in Mount Vernon, Ohio, and had a couple of hours to spend before my parents could pick me up. So I peeked into a movie theater across the street. There was no ticket taker. After waiting a while, I walked in after parting a curtain. Only two others were present, sit sitting together in the last row, their faces half-lighted. I chose a seat a few rows down, and the black and white movie began. Its title was Wild Strawberries, and the director was Ingmar Bergman. It was about the life of an old man who had once been in love, but it had not worked out because his beloved married his brother instead. This was the second film I can remember seeing. The first started started uh, co uh, Cowboy Hopalong Cassidy. So I was astonished when in Wild Strawberries, the old man had a terrible dream. The clock on the wall had no hands and some people were carrying a casket down the street when one of them tripped under the load. The casket fell to the ground and burst open causing an arm to flop out. We discover the corpse was the old man himself. What did I know of Ingmar Bergman, an art film? I was in grade school. But I'll never forget the dark theater, the dead arm, the timeless clock, and the two young women seated in back. The theater itself, a kind of camera, contained three innocent souls and the ephemeral images projected upon our faces. I don't recall telling my parents anything about the movie. We drove to our house in Danville, a village of a few hundred people in Knox County. The area was entirely rural, the gateway to Amish country. So why were they throw, showing Ingmar Bergman films in Mount Vernon? I later realized it was because Kenyon College was located in the nearby academic village of Gambier which was even smaller than Danville. I played Little League Baseball against a Gambier team. The popular singer and TV star Ricky Nelson had attended Kenyon. There was a local fable that a fraternity hazing cost the life of a freshman when they tied him to a rural railroad track, not realizing that trains were still running. It happened on homecoming weekend when his parents were there 
People in the town spoke of the college as if it were a world entirely apart, not to be trusted. Matters of town and gown are essential to poetics. With William Carlos Williams, the town of the poem, reality, is the dominant. The poem's gown is visible in its formal considerations, such as the triadic line. There was also the possibility that being so direct, it was not poetry at all. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow glazed with rain water beside the white chicken. Language poetry possesses a lot of gown because its grist is theory. On the other hand, the real world innocence, its real world innocence does exist in what might be called language realism, a belief that the poem might name and limit all in new sentence fragments. This explains the penchant for long poems with that group. They are painting the town with words, always in the middle, not middle ending. My poem Driver Song is more or less town poetics. I shall never reach Danville, Ohio, Danville, distant and lonely, black car, small moon and the backseat beer. Because I've forgotten the roads, I shall never reach Danville, Ohio. Over the plains through Indiana, where I was lonely also, black car, yellow moon, my dead father keeps watch over me from an upstairs window. What a long way from California and in what a fast car, invisible to the soul. Ahead I see death moving slowly on the road. I know I will touch her clothing before I ever reach Danville, Ohio. Danville, distant and lonely. The gown of the poem is the reader's recognition that the work is a lyrical parody of Black Writer's Song by Federico Garcia Lorca. Does that mean that it is any less sincere? Is sincerity a reasonable standard for poetry? Is artifice more reliable? Another important encounter was reading a poem by Wallace Stevens, The Connoisseur of Chaos, with its philosophical assertion that A, a violent order is disorder, and B, a great disorder is an order, these two things are one. I didn't know who Marchand was, of whom the poem speaks, but I was shocked and delighted by lines like, the squirming facts exceed the squamous mind. I was in high school. I didn't understand completely what it, mean, what it meant, but I knew it was a wonderful way to speak. It's charming, it's charm, it's seeming truth, and its crazy logic warmed me to poetry. When I started writing poetry at the age of 25, quite a wait. During the Vietnam War, Stevens became a gatekeeper for me. When I am in doubt about the value of poetry, especially my own, I read a couple of the insurance lawyer's poems, even though what I've read about his life is sometimes unpleasant. The same is true of Vallejo's Trilce, and Sermon on Barbarism, which are for me pure poetry. To keep my aesthetic balance, I like an equal dose of William Carlos Williams with a sidecar of Marianne Moore's The Fish and Gwendolyn Brooks's Re We Real Cool. Poems with exquisite proceduralist manners. Stevie Smith's poem, Pretty, is so truthful as to be lethal. It feels fresh every time I read it. Terence Hayes's sonnets for my past and future assassin should be read aloud to the Senate every morning it convenes. For the metaphysical, always a lure for me, I prefer Emily Dickinson's depth charges and George Herbert, whose formal inventiveness was astonishing. According to Hugh Kenner, of the hundreds of poems that Herbert wrote, a great majority, great majority were each in a different poetic form. For verbal uh, freedom and astonishing diction, I rely on Hart Quinn. I'm going to skip. W.H. Uh, Auden said that all poets should learn to cook and translate poetry. Uh, this follows uh, some comments about Maxine and Maxine Chernoff and I translating the Friedrich Hodelin, uh, and that actually changed my poetry, uh, reading that poem. Um, so, um, 
both uh, cooking and translating poetry are hus hospitable acts. Writing poetry is a hospital act. You are pleasing others. Writing poems is also possible, even if you are a poet of oblique and difficult measures. Translating Hodelin, as well as writing poems in Spanish, drew me toward lyricism and away from irony, though not all the way. Hodelin's late work, much of it in fragments, teaches how powerful broken and incomplete phrases can be. It also teaches silence. Here's a sample. On my Schwester, to my sister. I stayed overnight in the village, heir of the Alb, down the street, home again, son of home, canoe ride, friends, men and mother, slumber. And the men and mother slumber knocks me out every time. One day as a teenager, I discovered a stack of writer magazines in my mother's sewing room, which occupied an unused bedroom of the Church of the Brethren Parsonage we lived in. The windows of the room were not curtained, so light splashed across the polished wood floors as I sat in the corner reading them. They held interest for me because they revealed the secret she was keeping, that she was a writer and wanted something beyond the daily life of being a mother and wife of the pastor. Did I say mother and wife? Of oh, being a mother and wife of a pastor. Uh, with its prayer meetings and potluck dinners. She achieved her goal when the Church of the Brethren, the Brethren Press of Elgin, Illinois published her book, Through the Roads to Everywhere, her first and only, which dealt with the challenges of young people displaced by European wars. This explained why she went to bed early, sitting up with a notebook, pen, and papers. I returned more than once to read additional issues. I had no ambition to write. It seemed a dry and distant occupation. I see now that my mother's desire to make something, to inhabit the imagination, influenced me very much. It was from an upstairs window of our country house that I saw a fox cross the highway and enter the tall grass near the house. It is the fox that we recall, the sun glaze of the floorboards and the dusty scent of the attic where the books are stored, not the advice of writer magazine. The actual speaks with great confidence without words. In a poem, the actual benefits, however, from the irrational. Jean Cohen writes in his uh, uh, in French, structure de, de, la, de langue poétique. Poetry is the most passionate form of literature, the proxismic degree of style. Style is one. It comprises an infinite number of figures, always the same. From prose to poetry and from one state of poetry to another, the difference is only in the audacity with which the language employs the processes virtually inscribed within its structure. Poetry's range is great, but what moves us mo mo most is the oracle staggering from her cave, her mouth aflame. So thank you. Thank you, Paul Hoover. Ray Armentrout. Okay, um, mine is just pretty autobiographical um, and you know, prosaic, although I am going to read a little bit of poetry. And it overlaps in some ways with, uh, with Paul's. Uh, I'm from a working class background, the first in my family to go to college. And so my becoming a poet was somewhat improbable. It was encounters with, uh, with various people, just a few really, that opened that door for me. My mother read poetry to me when I was small. In a way, my life story begins with that. Poetry was a lilting rhythm, a familiar voice. It came with magical illustrations. Poetry was old. The owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. Poetry was a way of singing to yourself, even if you couldn't sing. It had rules. Little children like rules. Teenagers liked them less. When I was 12 or 13, I was already trying to write poetry, 
but I had traditional meters stuck in my head. I think I composed a book report in the meter of Hiawatha. That could be an apocryphal memory, but I remember it. I, uh, I was ready for something else, though. I wish I could point to one encounter that changed or even formed my idea of what poetry could do. In my experience, things rarely happen that way. Instead, there are a number of what people now call inflection points. Because I liked poetry, my seventh grade English teacher at Lewis Junior High in San Diego, Mrs. Hancock, gave me an amazing gift a poetry anthology called Modern American Poetry, edited by Lewis Untermeyer. My whole life, I have believed and often said that I discovered William Carlos Williams in that book, along with what they used to call free verse. I just looked up the anthology on Amazon using the look inside function. You can still get that anthology, actually, to see which William Carlos Williams poems Untermeyer had included. To my amazement, I found plenty of free verse there, much of it by people I had never heard of, but nothing by Williams. Still, somehow I remember reading metric figure in that book and discovering how good poetry could sound without formal devices, how immediate it could seem. How could such an anthology omit Williams? Did a later edition of the same anthology include that poem? Was I dreaming? I also remember encountering Dickinson and Pound in that book, and they are there. The Dickinson poems, of course, were reproduced with made up titles. She didn't title her poems and without the dashes. They look strange. There I first read number 585 in the Franklin edition, which begins, I love to see it lap the miles and lick the valleys up. What interesting verbs those are. Here a train is consuming space like a rapacious kitten, menacing and cute. Did my nearly lifelong fascination with Dickinson start when I read that? Maybe. I don't mean to imply that I had flawless taste at such a tender age. I was also taken with Stephen Crane and Sarah Teasdale. I'm pretty sure that if my teacher hadn't given me an anthology of modern poetry, I would have lost interest in writing, though there is no way to be certain. When I was a senior in high school, my English teacher, I can't remember his name, told me women can't write poetry. Nevertheless, I persisted. When I was a sophomore at San Diego State College, a daring young professor, probably adjunct faculty, assigned Ginsburg's Howell in 1967, as you might imagine, that poem could still provoke outrage. I found it exciting. I loved the propulsive syncopated rhythm of phrases like tea head, joy ride, neon blinking, traffic light. Ginsburg said other poets, Ginsburg and other poets and singers were pointing the way out. I didn't worry much about the fact that that poem begins with, quote, the best minds of a generation being, quote, destroyed by madness. I started looking at poetry anthologies. Eventually, like many people then, I came across Donald Allen's New American Poetry. That's where I first read Denise Levertov. I particularly recall Overland to the Island, in which a dog's gleaming fur is a radiance consorting with the dance. The words consorted with one another. Soon I would apply to UC Berkeley, where it turned out Levertov was teaching. If I hadn't moved to the Bay Area, it's unlikely I would have become a poet. When I arrived on campus, she had one space in her class. You got to choose your students then, that's exotic. And she was conducting interviews to fill it. I got there so early that I was first in line. When she called me in, I told her that I had come to Berkeley specifically to study with her. I didn't actually know that she was teaching there until I arrived. I wasn't in the habit of lying, but the words just popped out of my mouth. She looked at a couple of my not so great poems, we were supposed to bring in writing samples, and announced to the by then long line of waiting students that the place in the class had been filled by me. It was the year of the invasion of Cambodia, the campus strike and the People's Park demonstrations. Most of what she taught us wasn't formal, but she did advise me, advise me to think harder about line breaks. Like many beginners, I hadn't given that much thought. 
The most important thing I got from Levertov's class, though, honestly, was something quite different. The path takes a detour at this point. I met Rochelle Namaroff in Levertov's class. And when I went to visit, to visit Shelley at home, I met her then husband, Ron Silliman. I learned and have continued to learn a lot from Ron. He seemed to get my poems in a way no one else had. For instance, when Shelley asked why a poem called Release, which was later published in my first book, Extremities, ends with the word recall, and I put a hyphen actually between the RE and the call, which now I wish I could take out. Ron pointed out that several other words in the short poem also begin with the prefix, prefix RE. In retrospect, I could see that Shelley might have been questioning the value of the hyphen, which is heavy handed, but I got the feeling that Ron was interested in words down to the level of the syllable, as was I. He was a year older than me, but he was a lot more sophisticated about poetry and the poetry world, just from living in the Bay Area, I think. He had probably read everything Williams ever wrote, or so I imagined. He was well-versed in the New American Poets, Black Mountain, the San Francisco Renaissance, the New York School, the Beats. I knew a smattering of all that and thought that was enough. I remember he was shocked that I hadn't read Olson's projective verse, so of course I did. I'm not going to look it up now. What I remember is the oddly phrased maxim that one perception must move instanter on another. I liked the kinetics of that idea, but disliked the authoritative tone still do. I should have been thinking about what I would do after college. The word career was not part of my working vocabulary then. I should have been applying to grad schools or law schools, something. When I graduated, I moved back to San Diego and married my longtime boyfriend, Chuck. He was finishing college there. I got a job as a teacher's aide at a high school. Ron moved to Buffalo with Shelley and then back. They soon divorced. I didn't know any poets in San Diego, but I kept writing and I stayed in touch with Ron to some extent through letters. I only know this because it was Ron who suggested I send work to Bob Grenier for his new magazine, This, and to Clayton Eshelman for his, to his journal. And it says sulfur here, but it should say Caterpillar, which was Clayton's first magazine. I'm sure I wouldn't have known of these publications if it weren't for Ron. As it happened, I was published in both and thus had some reason for the first time to think of myself as a poet. In 1972, I applied to grad school at San Francisco State and was accepted. When Chuck and I arrived in San Francisco, I got in touch with Ron again and showed him the poems I'd been writing. I can't recall now what they were. He had published a book called Crow. It may be surprising to those who know Ron's work but haven't followed his career all the way back that Ron was really a minimalist then in, in that book. And I just, you know, not by decision but by natural inclination started out as something of a minimalist. I'll show you what I mean in case you haven't followed my career. This won't take long. A, a four line poem called View, which I wrote in about 1974, 1975. View. Not the city lights, we want the moon. The moon, none of our own doing. <laughs> in 1974, I gave my first public reading at a bar in Oakland called The White Horse. Ron read to, David Melnick, who had also taken Levertov's class was the MC, I think. There were probably other readers, but I don't remember them. Ron read from the manuscript of Ketchak. That book length prose poem was structured in a way that was immediately audible and completely new. The first paragraph was two sentences. See, by this time he wasn't, suddenly he wasn't a minimalist anymore. Anyway, the first paragraph was two sentences. The second was four, the third was eight. Each paragraph after the first repeated the sentences in the previous one, often in an extended form, while interspersing an equal number of new sentences. It was like watching, well, hearing the growth of some new life form. Each sentence in itself was a small act of attention to the recognizable world around us, but none related directly to the one before or after. He hadn't shown me any of this work in advance. I was amazed. I knew I had heard something that was going to make a difference in how poetry was read and written. And I think it did. 
Um, soon, Bay Area poets such as Lynn Higinian would be working in a somewhat similar way, which Ron dubbed the new sentence. Um, I tried the style myself briefly, first in the collaboration with Ron called Engines. So I'm going to see how long I've been reading. Do you want to hear? Well, of course, there's no way you're going to answer that. So I'm just, uh, I guess, going to read uh, a bit of my collaboration that I did with Ron um, when I was trying out the new sentence style. Uh, and I think this is kind of OK, but you know, it's not something I stuck with. Um, this poem, he, he proposed the form of it. It was to be alternating paragraphs. He wrote the first one. I wrote the last one. This is the last two. And you, I think you'll be able to hear that we're answering each other, but in some kind of oblique way. Also, there are angels in this, so, <laughs> as it happens, since I'm reading in a, in a sort of uh, church context. Um, so this is his, one of his paragraphs, and I'll pause after it, and then I'll read mine that's a response. <clears throat> Your paragraph. Pride is the plural. I put my tongue to the button. The mark of an attorney is contempt for the law. Theory is a place. Verbs never suit the frame. An angel named Mustang with blades of steel. Only part of the tree blows in the wind. Pistons contain the engagement. Propped wide lawns and three models of homes to choose from. At this distance, the skyline becomes sculpture. With the tower silent, each is left to his own devices and some become human, as if being pulled through a tunnel toward a globe of light. In the ashtray, the cigarette burns to filter. In my paragraph, you twist your key in the ignition. A woman mumbles and shakes, fucking as if to stimulate an ideal reader. A figure in white hovered at the end of this passage. So deathbed dreams are not incomparable? How am I supposed to feel? I mean, licks over those leaves? To master a branch of study? In dreams, one floats from room to room. Dressed to match vinyl booze, the young waitress hums absently. Content seems increasingly prescribed. Michael heals. Uriel descends in a chariot of fire. Elsewise, do nothing. So that was my experiment with the new sentence. Um, but after a few attempts, I decided it wasn't for me. That doesn't mean, however, that I wasn't influenced by this form, which became arguably the dominant style of the West Coast language poets. I began to divide my poems into sections which I saw as modular, separate from one another, while part of a larger whole. Even within sections, the movement between stanzas became looser and less predictable. Here are a few stanzas from the third section of my poem, Sense, in the book Necromance. First, the nonsense of direction. Stones to frogs, then to princes, who do a circle dance and turn to stone. Good night. Meaning extends her arm backwards, ballerina-like, would swirl in the formica. Those stanzas don't look like anything Ron, Ron would write, but his influence and that of other poets I met through him is there nonetheless. Um, so I guess I'm going to skip a little bit. I'm going to I said that uh, I became part of this group called language poets that included Ron and Lynn Higinian and Barrett Watton and Bob Perlman, Carla Harriman, Steve Benson, Kit Robinson, Alan Bernheimer. Uh, whether I act, I am reading it, whether I actually belong to this group was at times an open question. It was my friendship with Ron that really sealed it. As a group, we were in close contact with other outlier poets like Leslie Scalapino, David Bromage, David Melnick, and Erica Hunt. All such gatherings come apart. I was the first to leave. In 1978, I got pregnant. Uh, I think I'm going to skip some here, blah, blah, blah. Went back to San Diego, had a baby. Um, that's when I did the collaboration with Ron. Uh, anyway, OK, going to read some more. 
The quietness of my life in San Diego was almost eerie after the excitement of San Francisco. For at least a year, I stayed home with our son, Aaron, while Chuck worked. After so many years away, my old hometown seemed strange as well as familiar. There was something about this that was actually stimulating to my writing. My pace of production, which had been quite slow, started to pick up. I needed contact with other people, yes, but it turned out I also needed time on my own. Um, and I'll skip to the last short paragraph. I didn't exactly choose to be a poet. I just kept answering what spoke to me and this is where it ended up. Many would think it's a pretty strange place, the poetry world. It can be as cutthroat as life in any small pond, but this is also where I have found the closest thing to real communication and community. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> That was wonderful. And I, I know that there's going to be lots of questions um, in the audience, but I get the first one. <laughs> and it's for all of you. And uh, it has to do with you, you encounter poems and poets, but in each of these essays, place is very important as a formative element of um, of the of the poetics. And I wonder if you could say more, each of you, about how place has helped and formed um, your poetry over time. You better call on someone. <laughs> you spoke first, Ray, so. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. so I was hoping I was putting it off. All right. Um, well, I think that um, it, it has, increasingly maybe influenced my work. Um, I don't, I think that I, like I said, I think I wouldn't have become a poet if I hadn't gone to San Francisco. Uh, first, if I hadn't gone to Berkeley, you know, met Levertov, then met Ron Silliman, then moved to, to been a student at San Francisco State. I didn't talk about that, but I could have Kathleen Fraser. Uh, met the people I, I mentioned and other people in the Bay Area. And there was, you know, an intense ongoing conversation there developing about poetics that um, I took part in and that really was, was formative for me. But, you know, I didn't write much about San Francisco in, you know, for whatever reason. Um, but when I got back to San Diego, I, I started slowly, but eventually to incorporate um, the sites there, uh, you know, the, the plants or the stores, the, you know, the name, billboards, things like that started to get into my uh, work. And so it became more recognizable as having, I think, uh, you know, a location and a location that I'll, many people found sort of exotic and strange. Um, and then now that, that I've moved up here and changed to a different climate, because I'm living in uh, north, you know, northern Washington state, um, I was you know, once again struck by basically the natural world here, I think, which is so green and lush compared to San Diego and uh, just, you know, the, the leaves, the, vari the variety of trees, the flowers in the spring, that <laughs> those, if, you, if, if any of you have lived in the East, I'm sure this is how long to you, but I've never lived in the East. One story that I think is funny, we all of course know about lilacs, they're famous, and I know about them from poetry, you know, when lilacs lasted, the dooryard bloomed and all. Well, the first spring that I was here, we have three li three lilac bushes in our yard when we bought this house. I didn't know that. And, you know, one bloomed right out the window and I went, what is that purple thing? I mean, I, <laughs> I had no idea. Um, so, you know, it was a whole introduction into another uh, environment. And that has gotten into my more recent poetry too. So, you know, if you're attentive, you can probably, to my work, if you happen to be one of those people who is, you, you can probably pick that up. Um, 
There's a couple kinds of encounter there too. You encountered it through the page, but then the encounter in the world was a was a very different experience. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Paul, what do you think? Oh, you're you're muted. Sorry. Uh, I just realized uh, that I was focusing very much on my childhood and my upbringing, which is about fields and roads and ch and churches. Uh, you know that the space is uh, not vacant, but is present with uh, things that I didn't see in in the places that I live, that I've actually lived most of my adult life. Uh, that my childhood it keeps call, apparently calling back to me um someone a student after a reading of mine in san francisco said are you a you consider yourself a san francisco, francisco poet i said no uh I, you know i've lived here for 25 years but i'll never be considered a, a san francisco poet because i wasn't here at the founding moment of my generation I was in Chicago, right? So uh, 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 th there's there's no fault in that, uh, uh, you know. But you have to be there in progress, uh, growing your style in the in that place to be considered of it. Hmm. Yeah, and oh. I, people have did, you know. Uh, Maxine and I were welcome generously and. Uh, and, and so on, but there, that's just the way it is. Um, uh, so I, I'll say one more thing. Uh, there was an article in New York Times Magazine uh, in the 90s, uh, and it was a two, huge two-page spread of the kinds of poetry. And one of the, the kinds of poetry uh, was language poetry, and I uh, and uh, two, uh, Anne, Anne Lauterbach, I and uh, who was the third Maxine? Leslie Scalpino were identified as language poets. <laughs> and, and I went, what? <laughs> you know, who would mistake my poetry for language poetry? I think it, what it is is that my poetry can be sometimes dense enough not to be understood on the first reading. You know, it, it revels in uh, compactness and urgency sometimes. Uh -huh. It's telling who yeah. claims you after the fact too. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think I'm, I'm kind of a stew made of many influences. <laughs> Thank you. Elizabeth, too, it seems like there has been several formative places, but that Denver itself is, was shattering <laughs> in some ways to your poetics. Yeah, I think um, I'm thinking about uh, Creeley saying, talking about his company, his people. And so I think maybe more than place is mm -hmm. who the people are that form your community. I've lived quite a few places as an adult. Um, and I, I had this kind of ecstatic experience when I went away to college at Bard College and there were, you know, Robert Duncan came through and Ed Sanders and Robert Kelly was there and we could go to the city at any time and be with these other poets or invite them to come up, you know, like Bernadette Mayer stayed in my room when she gave a <laughs> reading. Um, and that sense of the the company of other people who say, yes, what you're doing is legitimate and it's of essential importance to me too. Um, mm. And, you know, I lived in some instances in exile, like I lived in Oklahoma for three years. <laughs> it was profoundly lonely um, and a kind of became a different way of entering community. I think it's a lot more stretchy now that we have so much electronic uh, exchange. Um, I did not like living in Colorado for ever so many reasons until I was 
interacting every day with people who had no place to live. Um, and they kind of took the narcissism and solipsism out of poetry for me and hmm. um, helped me to think differently about what it means to make things. Because hmm. as I tried to reference in the essay, so many other people had nothing. We're making really interesting, beautiful things. Um, at another place in that essay, I think I mentioned a woman who would not stay in the shelter because they said her jewelry making tools were instru deadly instruments. And so she basically said, then shelter isn't good enough. I will stay outside so that I have access to the things I need to make my art. Um, that said, I like the Bay Area because there's lots of interesting, generous people around. and. A lot of them are my friends, and so it's been a really good company for me. And uh, it sure doesn't hurt to be near the ocean. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's notably absent in Colorado, and that was devastating for me. John, can I can I beg you to speak on this? Place, uh, um, or whatever you want. <laughs> Well, um, uh, one of the things about uh, uh, Elizabeth's essay that really um, struck me was um, uh, the way that she uh, really explores the experience of people on the margins, um, uh, unhoused or, 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 or homeless. And uh, uh, there's often the assumption that um, uh, that um, they have nothing to teach us. And um, one of the things that I found fascinating about her essay was the way she kind of flipped the script um, and indicated, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Elizabeth, that, uh, that they're living with contingency, um, living in contingency <laughs> um, uh, with, without any net. Um, uh, seemed to provide uh, Elizabeth with a, a, a new way of thinking about poetry. Um, uh, and I, I just really thought that was, was, was fascinating. Um, uh, but I, I really do agree that um, the place makes a kind of, um, um, uh, exerts a kind of covert um, uh, presence on a lot of these essays. Um, uh, it certainly is that way for me. Well, thank you all of you. I'm going to open it up to questions. We're at five o'clock. Uh, if you have to go, please um, do. That includes our readers. Before you go, um, take a look at what's coming up at AMCA. We have a reading and discussion with writer, feminist, and ecological thinker Dina Metzger, who is probably most famous for um, writing for your life, a book on writing, but her most recent novel, La Vieja, is a combination of journal, novel, and um, eco-feminist take on what's going on. It's quite remarkable. We also have on the September 22nd and September 29th, Dallas Woodburn, a short story writer and YA novelist is going to give a, um, a workshop on how to write young characters authentic authentically. So if any of those interest you, please do. And please, let's open it up to questions. And I know there's one or two lurking out there, so don't be bashful. Or you can put it in the chat and I can, I can give voice to it if you prefer that way. And if you do have to go, happy Sunday to you. And you can certainly ask questions of each other. That's good. I, I have a question I could ask Paul. Uh, Great. It was about, you said that um, you were not a San Francisco poet because you were not there at the, in a formative time of your life at when I guess any kind of San Francisco scene of poetry was also forming at the same time. Well, I was, 
Um, but I only lived in the Bay Area, like I was saying before, for maybe if I add it up, I guess mm, maybe eight years as a young person. And then I came back for about a year later on to teach. So, but most of my life, life I lived elsewhere. So would you think of me as a San Francisco poet? That's my question. Well, that's a... I, I, you are generally associated with language poetry. Uh, uh, I knew that before. Uh, I know that your place was San Diego because I met you there. Yeah. Uh, uh, when the, in 94, when we were, the first edition of the anthology came out. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a reading and uh, we, we hung out a bit. And uh, yeah, I, I had a student from Philadelphia uh, who asked me that question because he was concerned about what his identity was going to be. He wanted to live in California, but uh, he was from Philly. Hmm. Yeah, uh, and you know, you you can. Uh, that's an ingrained personality. The Philadelphia identity, I suspect, as as most are. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I saw you as being over the boundary from language poetry as well. You know, uh, certainly there. And, and it's not like the language poets are programmatic in any way, uh, except for, you know, the uh, writing the middle, mm -hmm. tending to write the middle and not seeking closure. Uh, you know, keeping keeping the engines running uh, seem, seems to be the major uh, rule or a common factor. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking because I was, I was there in my formative years as a poet, in involved in that conversation. But then I was somewhere else most of my life. So it's it's sometimes people associate with me with San Francisco, and I see why. But on the other hand, I'm kind of not a San Franciscan. When I first moved, I don't want to go on and on. But when I first moved to San Francisco, I felt like. Uh, people took themselves very seriously there in a way that people from San Diego did not. And um, I, you know, I found that a little bit irritating, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the poetry wars were fought here. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, when the language poets came along it, uh, and the Beats uh, resented it very greatly because they brought, they, they went back to uh, poetics. The, the beats weren't the beats wanted life in, in its in all its immediacy right now, right? And it's a very a warm style and uh, a lively style. And it, San Francisco poetry is essentially thought of as beat poetry, but we know that much more than that is practiced here. So what do you, do you think people claim a form and then then find their voice through that or is a form a product of the voice that's emerging? Well, Does the, the voice seem to Levertoth, change over time? Denise Levertoth uh, uh, was uh, working on that, you know, uh, uh, this uh, and w Williams too. They, they weren't without measure uh, at all. Uh, uh, they're very much musical as well. So they they were they were making it bind so beautifully, but they were doing out of out of the everyday uh, occasion. You know, the dog trotting along in her poem, sniffing here, sniffing there, uh, uh, intently aware with each sniff, and that's that's a model for the poet. Mm -hmm taking here and taking there uh, from their experience. But I think of, you know, someone like Denise Levertov, who gets associated with the Bay Area that she lived, you know, not just here. And like a Duncan, who as 
uh, language poetry became more a, a, a central part of the conversation reacted really differently. Like I remember the Waldreps telling me that they had received a really indignant letter from Denise Levertov saying, why are you publishing this language poetry stuff? Um, oh, yeah. Duncan was really actively interested in it and finding ways to incorporate the ideas into his own very different kind of process. And I, I think, you know, I think of like a Barbara Guest, who's considered a part of the New York school, but was not writing like uh, Frank O'Hara, who was right. not writing like John Ashbery. Mm -hmm. And the ways that community and even place, they feed and they, uh, I don't know what the word is. Uh, they create permissions that don't necessarily reflect assimilation or unity, which I think is healthy. And uh, it, there was a famous uh, reading uh, where Barrett Watton was uh, uh, doing a lecture and pointing to different phrases and Robert Duncan charged the stage and pushed him off of it. <laughs> yeah, he's talking about Zukovsky and uh, Duncan didn't like the way he was interpreting Zukovsky and had his own you know, vision of Zukovsky. That's what it was about. Yeah, there were really were wars going on at the time. The, I think the older generation felt threatened by language poetry. But at the same time, one of the first readings I came to in San Francisco when I moved here in the early 90s uh, was Norman Fisher and somebody else. And I've told a lot of people this story. Some guy in the audience was so belligerent and was hectoring and hectoring Norman Fisher and correcting him and telling him that he was wrong. And I said to the people I was with, who is that? And why is he behaving that way to the reader? And they said, oh, that's Barrett Watton. He's the curator <laughs> of the series. Um, so, you know, his peer, his peer who had invited him to read was. Uh, when Maxine and I would come to California, uh, comment, uh, we'd come to visit her sister. Uh, so we were often here in the summer and we would look for company uh, and we were would often uh, see Barrett Watton and, and uh, Carla uh, and Car yeah and Carla and um, um, uh, in, in other words and we gave a reading at the uh, language poetry site what was it called New Langton New Langton that's where I heard and, the big fight and August Kleinschaller, who was a friend at that, at that time, uh, showed loyalty to us by showing up the reading, but he sat by the door with his arms crossed, looking very angry, you know, like regretful that he had to be, uh, to be there. Because he, he uh, you know, he, uh, he despised, he despised <laughs> that, you know, so um, Carl, Carl Ricosi, and uh, and uh, he were fr were friends, and they felt they opposed language poetry. So, yeah, we there. But we I, were we, also we were also very good friends with Carl Ricosi. So we were friends with with Barrett Watton at one point, and with Carl Ricosi. Yeah, we yeah. lived at both camps. And it was but because we didn't together. we didn't live we didn't live here, so we weren't part of the fray. You know. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> We didn't know what what it, what was really going on emotionally. Yeah, and we published. I, I left before the before the fighting got really intense. So I mean, of course, I heard about it, but I actually wasn't there on the ground for when the stuff for when the crap really came down, which was probably good. I was hiding out in San Diego. <laughs> Mike, you had a question, Kirsten. Yeah, I'm listening to, to this discussion a little confused about uh, just what language poetry is and what are these so-called boundaries. Well, it's uh, Gertrude Stein uh, plus subjectivism. Uh, and um, a Wittgenstein. So there's a philosoph philosophical revolution, uh, you know, with Wittgenstein. Uh, and uh, that that's a key. 
uh, the kind of a kind of relativism uh, comes into the poetry. So, um, for someone who's really kind of outside this conversation, I would say, Mike, that um, it borrows some ideas from surrealism and from some writers like Gertrude Stein, but often, especially with some of the earlier um, language poets, and you guys can disagree or correct me if you think this is incorrect. Um, there, there was some interest in using kind of the surface of language to frustrate our ideas of understanding so that you couldn't mm -hmm. assume that you knew what something meant. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of discussion of dereferencing language so that you might hear the word glass in a poem, but that doesn't necessarily mean glass. It might be more of a rhythmic attribute or um, part of an idea about how language works. And so some early, uh, and other people can refine this description, but um, some people like a poet like Denise Levertov were very indignant about this uh, and felt it wasn't sort of in the same way that some people looked at Jackson Pollock's paintings and said, a kid could do this. I object. Um, it, some it, it, it was a struggle. Very, it was a Can struggle. I say something? As, no, go ahead. <laughs> as someone who was associated with language poetry. Um, I think there was a lot of, there was talk like that. That was part of the poetics early on. Um, you know, that uh, the referential language was somehow bad, but it wasn't so much a part of the actual poetry. I mean, if you look at Ron's work, like like Ketchak, for instance, or chanting, I mean, one thing that you see is the city of San Francisco, the people who live, including, including the people who live on the street. I mean, Ron is, was very attuned to that. Um, you know, the da daily world without narrative, but with observation, that's often very um, close observation of the material circumstances around him. And that is therefore very referential. Um, and certainly that's true of Lynn Hedginian, who wrote My Life, which is an autobiography really in poetry. Um, so if you look at the major works of language poetry, they're actually quite referential. They're just maybe not referential in the way that people were expecting when they heard the word poetry. But then I, they, I had think, to expand them. they had to expand what they meant by that word. I think they were suspicious of the word of beauty that uh, if a poet is uh, manipulating or grinding uh, 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 toward um, a concept of conclusion and beauty, you know, the, are they the same? The, the closed fist, the the sigh. Uh, uh, you know, when people sigh at a reading, sometimes because something was beautiful, that you go, well, oh. But yeah. don't, don't you feel though? I mean, I I just don't like these um these. I mean, when you I I always say actually look at the text. Don't you find, I do, moments of beauty in, say, Lynn Hedginian's work? I mean, I find yeah, it. Yeah, but beautiful. it's beauty of uh, a, a different kind than the, the kind of metaphysical approach of. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah so it's that, exactly. It's finding a different kind of beauty or accepting something new as poetry, but that doesn't mean that it was in fact non-referential or that it was in fact ugly or unbeautiful or I don't, I mean, you know, yes, you can find examples of what you're talking about, but I think if you look at the major works associated with language poetry, those things aren't true of them. Well, they can be, but they aren't necessarily. Yeah. And I think that's the thing that's boggling about it is that it just, it unwound in more and more interesting in various ways. But I was just trying to give Mike, you know, like my early reading of essays by Ron and Bruce Andrews and Charles Bernstein, they would have said, I think, mm -hmm. a yeah. lot about dereferencing. That's true, they did. They said that, but, you know, then what they actually did tended to be different. And, and you know, Charles was probably actually closer to that in his early work. But he's was changed. The, <laughs> was the focus on 
the making of the poem or how, how was what was the thinking about how the reader actually encounters the poem was where was the focus well, I, I think um it's, I'm going to just answer this and then I'm going to shut up about it because one of my least favorite things really is having to <laughs> having to discuss language poetry. But um, <laughs> I think I think that uh, the the idea was, and I think this is really true of all poetry and of all literature, especially of all serious literature. But you know, language poetry made made this a, a kind of um, deliberate conscious proposition that the reader is a participant in creating the meaning mm -hmm. and that the, the meaning isn't just a given prescribed fact that you just could maybe have to ferret out but it's already there that the mm -hmm. the reader um brings his or her own reading to it and you know, to the words. And there's a kind of equal mean, meet, meeting, I guess, an encounter between the writer and the reader. Um, oh, wow. So I, I think- uh, yeah. So the sense that the language poets would be respecting the audience more by not being conclusive or direct necessarily, you could be oblique and uh, suggestive in your manner. Uh, the um, yeah, it struggled I, from where I was looking, uh, standing. Uh, what uh, the lyric was brought into question, as the lyric now had to be, we we couldn't conceive of it in the same way, hmm. uh, because it was more it could be more diffuse in its manner, um, not the transcendent, but the what what is. You know, so so-called language realism, uh, uh, it, the objectivists were very important in the development of all this, I think. Yeah, the, the uh, objectivists were, were very much respected, they, especially they thought that, yeah, it was uh, and often. And, yeah, that it, it was grasping. Um, and Niedecker, I mean, I think Niedecker was, was important to me and to some of the, especially women poets at the time. Um, Sorry, that's all I have to say. <laughs> I keep wonderful, saying wonderful poet need to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've gone far and I'm gonna stop the recording, but please, if this conversation would like to continue, I'm happy to, to to be here. But thank you very much for the readers and for John for putting together this anthology and for all of you for staying around. And and that's just not the end. I'm just saying stop on the recording. So if you want to stick around and talk poetry, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm going to go and, and start making getting dinner ready. So uh, 